thanks to everybody who came out to the show last night and recognized some faces. Yeah, Master Ace and um, Young Native are on the way. Um, my, my name is MC Defy. I've been at MC for about maybe like 14 years now, and the beat makers about the same. So I've been traveling ever since I started. I started out by like when I was a youngster. Um, I didn't want to have a boss. I didn't want to work for nobody either at that time. So I figured hip hop was my a perfect outlet for me because I love music and I love the poetry. So just making them together is like the best of both worlds for me. Hip hop provided that medium for me to like get you know that platform to speak on. And um, yeah, so I've just been on the tour for probably about two weeks now, but a little bit more. But with Master Ace for two weeks, it's been an honor. Also, the under um, took like uh, the driving responsibility, so I got hired to do that. So I'm clocking over 100 hours. So excuse me if I'm a little tired. Just got over a cold. But yeah, hip hop to me, I guess like um, part of Anthony's say was um, wanted to know what hip hop is it's like in the Southwest. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me anytime. But I learned a lot about hip hop basically coming up from like the b-boy era. So it's still there's still a lot of b-boys and b-girls practicing, but the type of hip-hop that I was really introduced to was like four elements of hip-hop, not just like the rap culture itself. So like when I first got started, I was always into like break dancing, um, style writing and rap, MCing, and then DJing. And I tried to dabble in every element because the hip-hop crew I'm a part of is called Foundations of Freedom. Um, used to come up here a long time ago, kind of become the Durango for at least about 10 years now. Used to be here at the Abbey, at the MC Battles, when the Abbey was the Abbey, even back when they had Club Uno Mas, even before they had Solid. So I've been kind of been here for a minute, but hip hop to me is, um, since my name is MC Defy, I came up with a name like Defy. It's like, um, came up when I was probably a youngster and I, I was a rebellious kind of individual. I didn't want to just go with the grain, you know what I mean? So hip hop was my way out. I didn't, I didn't fit in with exactly, when I was younger, I was uh, raised in Albuquerque. I was only, there was only one other Native American student in the school with me. So I was like, I wasn't fitting in necessarily to be like, oh, you look like this other kid who's over here. But like, I don't know. And then when I moved to the reservation, everybody looked at me like, you're not one of us because you're like, you're kind of like from the city. So you're not really like a true Native, you know what I mean, sort of speak. Um, so I kind of had like a little, issues like growing up and being like, well, where do I fit in, you know? So I was like, well, hip hop was so inviting to me and universal in a way where we're not even looking at each other's skin tone colors when we're in the room together, but more so like, you know, what's your skill set and content of character for, you know, instead of like finding, um, let me look at your skin, skin tone first. So I got invited that way as a youngster and hip hop to me uh, was universal in that sense. And I learned a lot from, um, from KRS-One and reading his book. I don't know if you guys ever read The Temple of Hip Hop. You read that book? Yeah, well, in, that, in the book, like, it talks about, like, you can't rest one breaks down hip hop. It's called, it's like an acronym, and, like, it's like her infinite power of healing oppressed people. I don't know if you guys heard that before, but that's what hip hop is to me, too, because I feel like we've been oppressed. Um, you know, everybody can be poor, but we as Native, like, Native people are kind of oppressed in other ways, too, so hip hop was my way to kind of, like, transcend that oppression and I, I want to get out. I mean, out of the reservation because I mean, what? But what can I do? I'm not that good at like ROTC. I'm not that good at like sports as much. Um, it was all right, but I mean, hip hop was like the first way for me to get away from the reservation and get back to like reacquainting myself with my ancient identity. Because you could do hip hop without having to have technology necessarily. We could all write a verse right now with just a pen and pad in our mind and just get creative that way beatbox for you or something, but you don't really need like technology to, to be hip hop or to do hip hop. You could break right here, open a circle up. So you know, I felt like we've been doing, I connect with hip hop in a certain way, like in an ancient way too, because as like, as, as Diné people, I'm Diné, like we, we revere the number four as a sacred number, and so is uh, hip hop is a sacred number too as well. Uh, I mean, four is a sacred number in hip hop too. It's kind of like how we have four sacred directions, four sacred mountains, similar like way like how you think four sacred elements of hip hop too. And um, you know, just how you have like storytellers back then who had practiced in ceremony. And hip hop like revolves around a circle too, just as how like we Native American people like the way they think about life is. 
And so there's so many connections that I was able to like grasp on as a youngster and be like, wow, this is something I could really connect with. Stuck with it over the years, and here I am today, you know, just kept on going with uh, touring. My man Wade Self, who got sick last night, he'd be here too, but he's the one who put a lot of work in and basically put this tour together. And, um, but yeah, hip hop also could be like KRS once said something like hip hop is also hydrogen, iodine, phosphorus, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. And you put all those, like, you know what I mean? Elements hydrogen and oxygen form water. Um, phosphorus has some ailments, you know what I mean? So, like, oxygen, you know, oxygen is good for us. So, hip hop is like that kind of sort of thing where it's just a conscious movement. Hip and hop, hip is the beat in the know. Hop is like being part of the movement. And so, it's just a conscious movement. You guys probably learned about this, maybe, but um, if you guys want to ask any questions or anything you want to know specifically, I'm here to answer any questions as possible. But Hip hop to me is like just basically my way of life now. It's not just um, a hobby for me. Uh, I became part of hip hop culture and just live it every day. Whether I'm driving Master Ace or performing or writing a verse, we have time. So, but um, yeah. How old were you when you got started? Like, like when were you? Like when sixth like grade. Grab sixth older. grade. Sixth yeah. grade. The first DJ who handed me the mic. I look at. I look to him as being like the cool Herc of native hip hop. His name is DJ Cedro. Um, he's also oh. his government name is Bert Denali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he was like a long time ago. He was the first DJ to be like, I always would ask people, like as a little kid, like, hey, could I rap during this high school dance or junior high dance or whatever? And nobody would be like, no, rap when I would get on, I'd play the slow jams. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I was like, all right, then I guess I gotta go home. And like, you know, for the first couple times, you're kind of discouraged. You're just like, well, well maybe I wasn't. I didn't perform as best as I should have been, maybe to like keep keep going, but just never giving up was the thing. And then, yeah, so DJ Cedro was the first DJ to hand me the mic. So I give him a lot of credit. I always like anytime I'm talking to anybody, I gotta mention him. Um, it was, yeah, sixth grade. And then I started playing drums in like jazz band and then concert band. So I was like, okay, now I, that helped me as an MC gain more knowledge about how to like apply rhythm to on uh, measures or bars, I would say. So that was like really cool to get like the drumming side too, or be percussionist first. So that helps me with my patterns when I'm rapping. I'll like, I know the difference between a regular, um, like a uh, 1 16th time kind of verse versus 132. So it'd be like, 132 is like a double time. Versus, so it'd be like one and two and three and four, but you know, 32, one unit, two unit. So that like really helped me out as an MC to be like, okay, now I know the rhythm, I know the cadence. It helps me about cadence mainly and uh -huh. flow. Uh -huh. So those are like some of your main things like you work on as an MC. Yeah. <clears throat> Where did you get like a lot of your first like beat inspiration from? For first beat inspiration? Yeah, yeah. Like who were the first couple of like producers? That yeah, that you really producer? like got oh, into. It's like, okay, those beats, those are the ones that I like. I think probably yeah. as a young, I really started to dig the Alchemist. You heard of the Alchemist? Yeah, yeah a little bit. Of, yeah, yeah. Alchemist is nice. Um, Ninth Wonder. Um, Dan the Automator. I used to be a big fan of Dan the Automator. He produced uh, like a lot of songs for a popular band you might know called the Gorillas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Gorillas. He was like the behind the scenes producer for one of their albums. They also have dealt with other producers too, but Dan the Automator, he was like. Uh, He's based out in San Francisco, kind of, and he kind of came up with like DJ Shadow and a bunch of other dope producers and DJs from like '90s, 2000s, and stuff okay. like that. So is that where like a lot of this Southwest kind of sound of rap comes from? Is it more adhering to like those kind of beats instead of like you know there's a more newer wave of like trap beats? Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. And so is it more like paying homage to like more old school stuff, like kind of like original loops from like vinyls and stuff, or? That I think cer there's certain groups and circles within the Southwest hip hop scene that okay. definitely like are about that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. About like stay staying old school and true to the, like the root of hip hop. Yeah, yeah. But then like the Southwest is like, you know, we're in between the East Coast and the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. We're right next to the Down South, and kind of like you know we also like look up to like Twin Cities too as being like a source of hip hop for like Brian Sayers and all the yeah. tree and like yeah, yeah. everybody up there doing their thing and. So like the Southwest is kind of like 
in between it all, and I feel like if you were to like describe the Southwest, it could be like inspirations from each. Set, each yeah, like, I could see that because there's West like homes or south down south. Right. Yeah. You can see that? No, 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 totally, because, like, down south, you know, you have, like, UGK and stuff. Right. And you right. have out west, you know, that's that whole scene. Yeah, And exactly. uh, that's sweet that you said you meant you gave a shout-out to, like, Rhyme Sayers and all them. That's, that's yeah. totally kind of like a Midwest sound, for sure. Right. Are right. you playing any shows with them on your tour? Um, with Rhyme Sayers? Yeah, like, um, anyone from them, like, Atmosphere, Brother Ali. Not on this tour, but we did, like, do a couple shows with, um, this tour, we had a couple special guests. We opened up for DMX like a couple days ago in oh. Santa Ana, in California. Okay. That was a sold out show. There probably leaves like almost 2,000 people. Oh, wow. So that was cool. And that is like the DMX, right? Yeah, DMX. Rough Riders. Rough Riders. So that, that was cool. So, like, we weren't originally going to do that, but then the two promoters were cool enough to be like seeing the bigger picture of it all and like, okay, well, let's just merge the two tours together and yeah. put everybody in one room. That's awesome. So that's that was cool. Sick. We opened our uh, locksmith. I don't know if you heard of locksmith. But he's a really yeah. dope MC. I, I like. I recommend you checking him out. He's a he's a good MC from um, the Bay Area. He Bay Area, MC. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Is he yeah. all about like those Mac Dre-ish kind of beats or? He, he's he's kind of like he's kind of one of like he's real versatile. He probably okay. rap on whatever. Yeah, yeah. He's really good. Like super talented. Okay, oh, yeah. that's it. You um, said locksmith is his yeah, name. Yeah, he battled too a couple times before. And he like kind of did really good at that, and now he just does music. Okay. Nice. Yeah, Southwest is a culmination of like all these kinds of styles together. Because I grew up listening to gangster rap, and then at the same time, another bunch of my friends were listening to like true school hip hop. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strictly. And so I was like, well, where do I fit? And I kind of just tried to just take it all in. No, exactly. Yeah. Sure. There's people out there too who can actually listen to someone's flow, maybe close their eyes for a little bit. And be able to tell where you're from just by how you rap. That happened to me one time from this rapper named Tone Death. Mm -hmm. He's another really dope rapper. I think he holds the Guinness World Book of Records for being like the fastest rapper out there. So yeah, yeah check him out and stuff, Tone Death. But he heard me spit one time, he was all like, this took like maybe about, he sat there for me like 15 seconds or something. He's all, you sound like you're from the Southwest. I'm like, how did you know that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because, because, like, the Southwest is, like, kind of cool because it's almost untapped still. I mean, like, we're no, kind totally. of getting our, like, word out and getting, like, recognition now finally. But it's, like, been a long time. And so, like, exactly. a lot of people don't really know. Like, there's not one huge rapper that strictly claims the Southwest has blown up, like, completely, you know? But exactly. Everyone's not all the main about rapping, but, yeah, uh, yeah, it's... It's sweet. Make, yeah, make it more noticed. I like that. It's yeah, like, I'm trying to make, you know, because we love hip hop just as much as they love hip hop, you know. So like we felt like we put we're paying as much dues or putting as much work in, so we might as well get a little recognition for it if we can. But it's not the main goal. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So do you incorporate like some native activism in your raps? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I do. I have this new song that just came out with. It's called The Land of Enfragment. You know what I mean? Um, like New Mexico, is, New Mexico is the land of enchantment. You know what I mean? But like, I, I drive from Farmington to Albuquerque a lot. My family is from Shiprock, and I live in Albuquerque, so I'm driving back and forth all the time. Right by Chaco Canyon, they have a huge like frack zone area and stuff. So I just drive by there, and I kind of got sick and fed up of it because um, I mean, like, I seen a the really nice sticker that kind of explained what fracking is, like on last night. One of the booths. I don't know whose sticker it was, but yeah. they said like draining <laughs> clean water for dirty oil. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't agree more with that statement. And so like, even just standing by there, because I we shot a music video for, for that song, and it's about to come out in a couple weeks. But we were right next to like the where they're doing the flaring, and man, it just stinks so bad. And I tell you, like you can get sick so bad from just standing right by it for a few minutes. The director got like sick for just being there for like little bit of time, you know, and I was like, man, imagine how what the workers go through. I started to talk with some of the workers there, and, you know, it's kind of a tough situation for them because they don't have any other opportunities to make money, and so we can't really look at them down for, like, trying to feed their families, but at the same time, I'm like, yo, we need to, like, figure out some other ways where we can make some funding so you can support your family, but it's hard to explain to them when you're just right there in front of what their job, you know what I mean? You can't really, like, you want to tell them something, but you just like, they're really interested in what you're doing. Like, oh, you're shooting a music video. Little do they know, I'm like, 
rapping about what the kids <laughs> They thought that we're, I was using like the flaring for like some cool special effects in the back. Like, <laughs> so you have that as your background? Yeah, it's in the background. I'm just like rapping in front of it and stuff, and it's 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 pretty strong, like um, like message. I, I don't really like. Uh, for the song, I guess I'm speaking is just like from just reporting from what I see, yeah. kind of that that kind of viewpoint. I don't really want to like make anybody feel necessarily bad. I, I think I even have cousins who work in the oil fields too, and, mm -hmm. um, but I just gotta like take my stance, you know. Like, it's, well, those jobs could be turning into renewable energy jobs. Right? Right. True. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no reason it has to be fossil fuel. I mean, that's job true. opportunities. Are, I believe that too. Definitely. Yeah, good question though. Yeah. How long is that music video? Yeah, it's coming out soon. I think probably in two weeks. I'm just kind of in. Do so you put it online? Or like yeah, it'll be on YouTube. And stuff. On YouTube. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying it's to call it the land of infractment. The, the land of infractment. Yeah. Okay. I can spit the verse if you want. But sure. Heck yeah. Yeah. Do it. All right. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Um, I guess with no beats, we'll check it out. All right. <laughs> As earth soil is exploited on the map, they got the oil on tap, enjoying spoils of the frack. They try to lie to us and say that this does not occur, but the truth is the creating agents that are aquifers. Play the mockingbird, face another officer. All in the meanwhile, they're taking rape another plot of earth. Greedy CEOs hide beneath the blame, and they claim it's their golden goose, so why should we complain? I'm trying to free my people inside of this evil frame. I'm tired of this greedy game and the lies that will eat your brain. Strip people from the land and start making this money, and you wonder why foreigners have a hate for this country. We look fake and so ugly, faceless, tainted, so bloody, from the eyes of a child who's jaded, naked, and hungry. I respect hardworking people with the trade and the vision, but there's other ways of getting paid and making a living. It's crazy what they can do to say to pay for your pension. Awake the slaves to the system and break the chains from this fiction. Contracts fill with trickery, that's an understatement. All I know is that in this industry, there's nothing sacred. You can test for the chemtrails in the rain puddles. Remain humble because we all came from the same struggle. Strike a match and maybe flick a lighter to a faucet and watch tap water catch fire. They're making millions off of misery and liquor sales. But one day the mother earth will tip the Richter scale. And those pipelines will get stripped like Chippendales. All these issues are artificial like missile trails. Until it hits all the ditches and the wishing wells. And if you work for the companies, I'm not trying to diss you. I really wish you well. Tap it till it's drained with acid in our rain. Come to a naturalization and we can catch and feel the pain. Currently they're searching for a planet to invade. Looking for alien natives to capture and enslave. Creating more jobs in our environment's expense where the truth won't cut it like the IRS's checks. They want you to survive on your retirement and invest. Play and catch with us and rely on us to fetch. Success is rising up and flying on excess. We're stressed on a daily basis, tied up in this mess. They watch the world plumbing out its cybernetic legs and hire someone to burn it down for pyrotech effects. Fire anyone who is defiant or against to put a rifle to the chest if you're a rival of a threat. I wish we could all cipher and siphon out the rest, but truthfully, the actions are stifling at best. Whatever we can count in the mountain now today, it won't compare to future generations down the way. And at times, I feel like I can't rely on my own tribal leaders for lying and signing deals with those supplying glyco ether. Polluting our people and is dividing the land. The pursuit for the root of all evil leads to the demise of this plan. The land of infractment, gas is extracted and trapped in hazardous acids and planted and trapped in our sand pit. Canada and back, the passages cracked in fragments, actual facts handled the track and track damage, having a bad trip and imagining what you had for granted, pack of random acts for random acts, cat, random <clears throat> acting backwards, the truth runs, the money runs higher as the fire runs rapid, package and cancel the masses where they damage and impact the planet. That's <laughs> It sounds a lot more together when it's on the beat. You know? <laughs> yeah, that was great. And I was wow. just kind of like my person just saying it, talking it out. You know what I mean? But yeah, I, I really put more like emphasis on the rhythms and like my words and stuff when I'm when I'm doing it on the track. But yeah, that's like the wow. basic, that's, those are the lyrics like they're from the beginning to end. I didn't really just I, I wanted to put a chorus because the end is like the hook. But I was like for this song, it's like it's just kind of I didn't want it to be too redundant. Mm -hmm. So I was just like I'll just put the hook one time but no no repeat. No. Just at the end. So you might not even know it's an actual hook when you hear it. You'll probably yeah. think it's a part of the verse. No, that's sweet. I like that, that kind of so repetition. Nice. That was yeah. 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 I appreciate it. Yeah, beautiful. Morning. 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 Morning.
Yeah, so, but yeah, thanks for checking it out. Yeah, well, now that's the ace is here. Um, what I miss? <laughs> we, just talking, we just introduced each other, talking a little bit about hip hop and activism a little bit, and asking you about some lyrics. That's about it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Max the Ace. So, thanks for so And we're also just kind of talking about like hip hop and what it means to you. What's oh. the first thing that. Uh, yeah, what is hip hop mean to you? How'd you get involved? We were kind of talking culture and how the cultures are different everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, politics, too. Like how you use it. Is well, for me, uh, it started off as kind of just the neighborhood fad, the thing with me. Um, we're talking about uh, the late 70s. Um, I was in junior high school, and uh, around that time, I almost say it was about 77 or so, um, there, were these, there were these tapes that were just floating around New York City uh, that were from parties that were happening around New York, in the Bronx and Queens and different places. And uh, there were these DJs that were uh, cutting and scratching breakbeats, and uh, they would find you know different disco records, and there would be this cool point in the record where the drums would break down and whatever, whatever. So the DJ would just keep bringing that part back, bringing that part back, and um, we liked it. It was kind of cool. It was kind of exciting. And uh, there was a kid that I was in uh, seventh, it was in my seventh grade class named Michael, and he had actually gotten his hands on a few of these breakbeats, and uh, he loaned them to me. Just for like a weekend, like you can hold these for like a weekend. And uh, me and my, my best friend and, and another good friend of ours, we didn't even have a full DJ set up. We like were like, okay, you got a turntable, I'll get one from this guy. And this, this this is way before techniques and all that. This is like these are like belt drive. You can't even backspin on them or anything. Just like <laughs> the oldest kind of turntables, and we had so we had like mismatch turntables, and we some borrowed a mixer from somebody. All of this just so we could. Play a break beat and, scrap and bring it back and try to get fast and do all this kind of stuff. And that's how it started for me. That's how um, I became uh, acquainted with the culture um, as I started off DJing. Um, in the, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, early 80s come around and, you know, all of a sudden now, these same instrumental tapes started to have rap in them. And, uh, that was kind of interesting. So now we can't just put instrumental tapes out. Now we have to actually put some voice on it. Um, I was in a DJ crew of about five, five of us. And uh, I was like fourth best. So I, I wasn't exactly at the top of the list. So I chose to, let me see if I can add some, some vocals to our tapes. So I, I kind of bit the bullet and started kind of figuring out some rhymes to make the tapes more interesting. And at first I wasn't, uh, really write my own stuff. I would listen to the rap that the guy in the Bronx did, and I would change a couple of lines and put my name instead of his, and you know, um, make it fit my life, and just basically fix it up. And that's how it started. That's how the tapes first started. Um, and uh, that's that was kind of, I guess, for me, the transition from being a DJ to being a, a vocalist, uh, an MC. But those were the early stages of it for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my kind of introduction into it. Of course, in the neighborhood also, we were, we call it popping, but lucky boogie, right? So we were doing that. Um, there was a swimming pool in my in my projects, uh, right behind my building, and the, there was a DJ that would come out and bring a set out to the swimming pool and play music. And Soul Sign of Force, uh, Planet Rock came out, and everybody would go to the swimming pool and battle That's the kids out there breaking too, but you know, we were like kind of like the, our, our, our crew was kind of like, well, we don't get on the floor, it's dirty. Like, we want, to keep, we want our, our clothes to be nice, so we'll stay up top and do all this kind of stuff. And uh, so the battling in the swimming pool doing this, that was another whole other thing that was happening. Um, and all of this stuff was happening at the same time. Uh, graffiti was all around us, um, and I decided one day that oh, this graffiti thing is kind of cool. I saw a, a documentary um, on uh, public access television or PBS or something like that. Um, and it 
was a, it was a, it was, what's the what you call it? Um, it was about these graph artists um, in New York City. I don't know why I can't think of the name right now. But uh, I saw that documentary and it had a huge influence on me. Uh, so freshman year going into high school, I was already carrying peace books and writing in my building hallway, which definitely was not <laughs> something I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> I remember my, 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 my uncle was, uh, he was uh, telling my mother, I think your son's writing on the, in the elevators and stuff. <laughs> and she was like, why do you think it's him? I don't know. This is, and I was, at the time I was writing Klein, C-L-E-I-N. She was like, I don't know, this is, this is a Jewish name. It's, it's something he would do. <laughs> <laughs> so my family was definitely trying to figure out what I was up to. Um, and uh, so I was doing that on the side, and there were uh, some real established graffiti artists right in my neighborhood, some guys that I was, was cool with, but these guys were like, they were a little older than me. They were actually going to train yard. Like, I was, you know, 14. I wasn't hanging out past a certain hour, you know. These guys were going out at 2 a.m. when everybody was asleep, and they were going to the trains and, like, literally, risking life and limb, going through train tunnels, crossing over the third rail and avoiding being hit by subway trains to write graffiti. I never got to that level. I was too young at the time. But um, I learned a lot from those guys and, and my excitement for graffiti. All of this stuff is happening kind of at the same at the same time. So you, you're coming up, up in it the same way that you know video games are the thing, the craze now, or hoverboards, whatever it is. That was the that was the thing to do. Right, graph, DJ, pop, and rap. It was all part of what we did in our childhood. Yes, sir. I'm curious when you uh, it doesn't sound like from the start that hip hop was like a political thing to you. When did you realize that it was like a political thing? I'm curious like the, the political angle, if you will, didn't really we didn't realize the, the potential of it to be a political force, I don't think, until Public Enemy. When they came out, the messages that they were putting on the record were different than what we were hearing. From, yeah, because up to that point, everybody was just kind of rapping to show that they were the best rapper. Like, I'm better than you, I'm going to show you my the lyrics. Um, and, and then, you know, Public Enemy you know, came out, and just the name made you go, well, what does that mean? That's interesting. What's that? Um, they had the logo and the guy in the crosshairs, and so I mean, it's all great marketing, obviously. But you know, Chuck B had a vision. Um, they had the S1Ws and, 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 and all of that going on, and um, it just made it opened eyes up to how the music can now also be conscious and carry a message with it. Um, I think that from a political standpoint. For me, they were, the, they were the first group that kind of woke me up to the potential of, of, of the music and its message. Um, my very first album, which came out in 90, um, I was considered, at that point, a conscious rapper. Um, I had, had, had songs that where I was trying to talk to uh, the kids in my neighborhood and uh, explain to them that um, this surrounding, this, this community that we live in, you know, this is a this is sort of a, a plan and a cage, and if you want to get out, you can get out. Don't think that you have to stay in the projects and stay in this environment. You can do more with your life. So that was the that was kind of the overall theme of my first album. Uh, it was a little too preachy, I think. Um, it, it definitely missed the mark with a lot of listeners um, because I think it was too preachy, but. Um, I just, uh, it was on that first album that I started to understand that the music could be more than just, I rap good. I have a quick question. About 35% of the students who are on this campus are, are native, or indigenous. So, and we have young, native, five. Um, how is, two part question, how, from you, from an outside perspective, has indigenous and native hip hop, uh, um, developed hip-hop in a more complex way, 
And then uh, the other part is like, what do you all think from a native perspective? Do you all um, think you all have to give to hip hop? <coughs> Well, does that make sense? What would we have to give, or what, what, what would you like to give? What does oh, indigenous and native hip hop give to the larger global hip hop community? Uh, and then, what from an outside perspective, AIDS, what do you see indigenous and native um, hip hop artists giving? So, like, you could see it from an outside perspective while you all can see it from an inside perspective. Well, for me, like, hip hop, for me, like, when I first started doing hip hop, you know, like I, I had to learn from like the culture, I had to learn from like, like actually do my homework. You know, like got old Run DMC CDs. You know, did the whole nine, Eric B. You know, rock him, all that stuff. And I just in high school, all I did was just listen to old school hip hop. And then eventually, I got records because you know I can't rap. You know, and I'm not the other lyricist. You know, but you know, I love beats. I love music. You know, and all that is really important to me because like not only is it important into my indigenous culture, like it's important to hip hop culture too because like how I kind of compare the two, it's kind of like, I don't know, like, like how I, I usually like tell kids this, especially like up, up north where the Dakota Sioux, uh, um, like where powwow comes from, you know? Like me and myself, like now it was, we don't do we have different traditions. Like I know everyone gets typecast and like, oh, you know, all the Americans are powerful. That's not necessarily true, you know. But what I like to compare it to is powwow. Like hip hop and and powwow are basically the same thing, you know. Like when you look at the MC, there's an MC at a powwow who who's the master of ceremony who controls the whole crowd. He introduces the drum the drummers who tell stories, who crack jokes, who have crowd participation, you know? And then you have <clears throat> the dance, you know? Like you have the actual dance, you have b-boying, you have grass dances, and, and uh, you know, all the different dances for power, you know, there's different styles for that too. And then the same thing with b-boying, you know? You have you know, footwork and papa lockers, you know, and casket power moves, you know? Like all that stuff is different too, you know? Then, when it comes to the art, like graffiti, when you look at the apparel that the powwow dancers wear, you know, with the headdresses and the, you know, the jingle dresses and everything, all that's graffiti, you know what I mean? All that's, all that's, you know, part of the culture, you know? Same thing for graffiti, like, when you look at the walls and phase two, and you look at all the, you know, pioneers that foreseen and how they actually, you know, created an art form. You know, like they're like Picasso's of urban, you know, of the modern age almost, you know what I mean? And obviously the drum, you know, the last part, the drum is the most important thing, you know. And as far as in indigenous cultures, not only in Native American, but in African cultures too, like the drum is the is the representation of the earth. The whole beating of the drum is the heartbeat of the earth. You know, that's when people who do powwow and sing like that's they sing to the earth and they, uh, they, they get all the spirits and all the gods and they have them come down and they sing to them and they tell them these stories. And even when you're singing in powwow or even you're singing in a peyote meeting or even if you're just at home praying with yourself or shoot, or even if you're listening to your favorite song like me, whenever I get high, I, I, whenever I get listen to like Charcoal Quest, I just, like my mood changes, you know, like it just, I could feel, have like the worst day ever, and when you hear Bonita Apple Bomb or electric, you know, electric relaxation, and it just changes my whole mood, you know. And in a sense, that's like a spiritual moment, you know, like the, those songs and those recordings and that energy and those vibrations and those frequencies will hit your body, and will, you know, hit your eardrums and it'll hit your brain, and all of a sudden it's all over your body. I mean, when I hear music that I love, like I get goosebumps, you know. Or even when I'm, yeah, whatever. Even when I'm playing an instrument or DJing or singing along with my dad with the native song or a native chant, or whatever, you know, like it's all spiritual. You know what I mean? So even though that I'm doing this right now, it's kind of like a modern way of powwow in a sense. You know what I mean? And 
as much as I like to do this, and as much as I like to do it as a profession, you know, I take it very seriously because it is a true culture, and it is something positive, and it's something that people are mis uneducated about, and also it's also misrepresented. You know what I mean? I mean, there's not only just four four elements. There's five, or six, or seven. You know, when you look at beatboxing, that's that's a hard, that's a hard thing too. It branches off from from hip hop, the clothes that we wear, the, the album designs that you see. You know what I mean? All those are just it's all art forms. People writing about pieces and like the source or blogs. You know, like a brochure for heads. Like all those are big outlets where people are contributing to the culture, you know what I mean? So, if you, I mean, even if you're not involved in those four major elements, you're still a part of it, even if you're a listener, you know? You're still an advocate for your culture, even if you go out to a show, you know? Mm -hmm. Or even if you, like, oh, here, like, check this out, I'm going to put you on this right here, you know? Like, that's, that, that right there is the, the biggest thing, like, if I, when you, have, you give somebody something, you're contributing to the culture, you know what I mean? You're giving positive energy to people, and you're giving a good message to them, you know? I mean, other people may have different interests in music, you know what I mean, or may see things differently. I mean, maybe you look at, like, the other side of hip-hop and rap music, you know? Like, there's a big difference between that, too. There's a big difference between rap and hip-hop, you know? Rap is just, like, the DJ and the MC, you know, the rapper, you know? It gives more shine on the rapper because they're telling more of the story, you know. But the culture of hip hop consists of all those things, you know. Not just those four elements, but the five and the six, you know. So, I mean, as far as how I see it, you know, this is how I treat it, you know. Because I can only take it that way because that's how I was raised with my indigenous culture, you know what I mean? And I just kind of compare the two with everything, you know. Different indigenous cultures, you know. I mean, I'm in New Mexico. We live in a state where there's 13, 14 different Pueblo tribes, and each of them have different languages, but yet they live right next to each other, you know. And you know, we're all different. And you know, the good thing about all this is that music, culture, prayer, tradition, all that brings us together, no matter what color we are, where we come from, you know what language we speak, and that's the beautiful thing about hip-hop, and that's the only thing that I can give back to you guys, or to my listeners, or the people who, you know, want to contribute to that, you know, the only way that I can do it is try to do it the right way, you know, the best way I can find it, so that's the only way I can, you know, go off of that. So I've, always, I've always felt like In our neighborhood, there was many different uh, races, cultures that played with different things. Um, there were no native kids in the neighborhood as well. Um, and I had a kid, a friend of mine, when, when I was a kid named Clifton, who I never, like, when we were that age, like, it wasn't like, a, what are you? Like, that wasn't a question. It was just like, you're my boy. Like, you look different, you got the cool hair and shit like that. <laughs> Straight. And your skin is like real red, that's dope. But it wasn't anything deeper than like, well, what are you? Because I'm whatever. It was just we hung out. I, got, I, I posted a picture of me and him, like, from, man, we were like, I was like 10 or 11 or something. And uh, we were just hanging out with my grandma's crib, in my crib, my grandma's crib. And, uh, but hip hop was always all inclusive. The neighborhood, if you had, I want to say courage, but if you were down to be in that park at night when the music was playing, and you walked in there with confidence, you were good. You were good. Um, just don't wear a jewelry, but other than that, no. you were good. You were good. Um, it's, it's, it's always been that way. I've actually learned a lot just on this tour, traveling with, with these brothers. Um, you know, I learned a lot from, from Native, just he's, Giving me a lot of background, things that I never, I was never taught. You know, the, the the American educational system doesn't do a good job of teaching 
this is the, the, the proper history. There's a lot of fake, like, fake technology being taught. Mm -hmm. And you know, my daughter's 11 years old, and she's in fifth grade, and I'm looking at her history homework. I'm like, this is the same. You your stories that you teach teaching about. Was, was, so I'm having to, as she's going through and, 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 and answering her questions for her lesson, I'm giving her the backstory. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, discovered America, okay. And I, and I said, now, explain to me, how, how did he discover America and when he got here? She's like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. People are already here. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> she gets it. Um, and, you know, it's good because she got her homework done. Like, she, she, she gave the answers that they expect to have. But she didn't, she didn't take away from that, that this is fact. She understood that there was a lot more that went into it. Um, it was really interesting how um, they really gloss over the genocide that took place when, 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 when these folks landed here. Um, I mean, it was so smooth when they glossed over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> many died. It just said many died. <laughs> no specific, no details. So I, was, I, would, I would fill in the blanks for her, and I would tell her, yo, they came here because they wanted this land, and anybody who was opposing it, they would kill it, straight up. And she was like, why, why? Trying to explain to everybody as much detail as I could um, that that's what greed does, and um, un unfortunately, uh, an entire you know race of people almost was wiped from this land. And she got that, and she understands that. So as she goes off into high school, no matter what is being sent her way educationally, she's going to know what the real is. Yes. Yeah, how do you do it? Well, like, we're, um, I was mentioning a little earlier, like, uh, hip hop to me, like, I connected from a more dramatic phase too, and I'm sure a lot of people too, but I feel like it's a spiritual experience for us. Like, for me, as a demand person, before I was a you know, hip hop practitioner, part of the culture, like, we were, like, we've grown up, like, you, you respect the four sacred mountains, four sacred directions. And when I found hip hop, it was like the four elements right there. The way like both cultures revere that number, the sacred number, <coughs> like it was like instant for me to be like, oh, this is something that's inviting me. Really. I could get down with this, you know. And then also later on, I was like, as part of me giving back to the culture, just to add a little bit more. It's like Native Americans sometimes we get viewed as like stereotyped as being like drunks a lot, a lot. You know what I mean? But me, I don't, I don't drink at all, and I want to at least portray our people uh, on stage, off stage, no matter where. Not just that, you know, we're not just all a uh, whole population of just drunk alcoholics or people who are suffering from um, post traumatic experiences, trauma that happened in generations before. Like, I feel like we're healing now and we're starting to thrive again. And I just want to be like a living representation of that through the culture of hip hop as an MC and then a comedian too. But trying to be a positive um, male role model because we kind of go past me. So like hip hop kind of like helped me in that way too. Be like I started listening to rappers more so because my dad wasn't really the best in life. <laughs> so like hip hop kind of was there for me to help kind of be a big brother to me and kind of help raise me to be a better person in a way. And that's kind of like now that the skills that I'm trying to work on my skills, the skills are also working on me to be a better person. So it's kind of like back and forth in relationship with like not just give and take, but it's like you know what I mean. It's reciprocal. Um, so. As if you're not working on your skills, the skills are also working on you to be a better person. So giving back in that sense of you know, kind of mindset too. And real quick, just to touch on the whole uh, native hip hop thing. Um, that term right there doesn't it's right you know, I, I got a and I get a lot of backlash from the community that way, you know what I mean? Uh, just because how I grew up with hip hop, I wasn't typecast like that. I mean, we're like Native Americans are minorities of minorities. You know what I mean? So we're like, 
for like, I mean, native hip hop, like what, I mean, I don't know, that's, that doesn't exist, you know, like how I was taught and how things were, were, were brought upon me, like, I mean, hip hop's hip hop, everyone, yeah, and, and honestly, hip hop is a conglomerate of all these cultures, it, it, it literally is, like, look at when Cool Herc first started uh, having the big old speakers in his, in his, in his car, Though that actually goes back to roots and reggae, when reggae bands used to go around to different villages on a flatbed truck, and they would play, and all these people would follow them to go to this yet in the middle of nowhere, and they would all jam out, you know? Same way with like having block parties, you know, in, in projects back then, back, back in the day, you know? They're, they're in the projects. And I mean, it's, it's a similar thing. Then when you look at the drums, you know, it's all from rock and breaks and, you know, modern day folk music, you know, and the samples, you know, and you have James Brown, you know, to make it more funky, like, you have all these things and all these elements to, to make one culture, you know what I mean? And all that culture is, is made to unify us, you know, the, the, and, and as far as being in Universal Zulu Nation, like, that's one of the, the keys that they tell us, you know, is, is to, you know, just to love one another, you know, positivity, just love hip hop and having fun, you know, those are the main things, you know, is to, just to give back, you know, and, and when I was, when I was growing up, like my, my, my Nelly, which is my dad's dad, like he taught me, like, the only reason why we're on this earth is to help each other, that's the only reason why we're here, you know, so when you start saying, like, oh, that's Chicano rap, oh, that's Native rap, or that's Native hip hop, it's like you're already making borders up for yourself, you know what I mean? It's like, I mean, yeah, there's like Native events that happen like during gatherings that have all these Native Americans who are in hip hop there, you know? And that's the event, yeah. It's not any different than like having the Latin American Music Awards or whatever, it's not any different than that, yeah. There's a genre of people who are majorly influenced and they also give influence to a lot more people. Not whether if they're they're non Latino, non native or black, whatever, you know what I mean? I, I grew up on um, like Randy MC, Jam Master J was was a shit to me, you know, like <laughs> honestly, you know? Then eventually it started off to, you know, Jazzy Jeff, then I'm talking to Hubert, who's who's uh, uh, you know Polony or uh, um, Filipino, you know? So uh, then after that, like, I found Revolution, and he's white, you know, and then all these different DJs who are just all different cultures are like, holy crap, you know, like, why isn't there a native DJ out there like that, you know? So that's what influenced me more, to be like, well, I want to go out there and do my own thing, you know? So, yeah, so I try not to, like, put no borders up with that, you know, that way, so. I was going to say, it's, it seems interesting, like, because of you know, you were talking about like the different regions, and it seems like there are a lot of different cultures that go into it, a lot of different people from different backgrounds, but there's somehow like a unity in all of that. That's like the sense that I'm getting. That's the beauty of hip hop. Yeah, and I think that's just really, you know, in, in this class we talk a lot about like when we're divided by things like race and culture and background, that's when we aren't able to like make positive changes in the world, so it seems really meaningful. I, I really can't think of another form of music that is as inclusive as hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 don't, I don't know another genre that, that is welcoming to all. If you, if you like the beat and bob your head, you bob your heads together. <laughs> that's, that's what hip hop has always been. Yeah, there's uh, in the Bay Area, um, Crip hop with disability people, you know, and uh, and then M1 with like helping with the vegan movement um, of hip hop. Like everybody's getting in on it, you know, finding their soul. Yeah, there's like nerd rap. Yeah. Although there's like different styles, that's kind of kind of dope because I mean, regardless of your style, you're still gonna have people. Like, not to say there's a market for it, but there's an outlet where people will still like that. I mean. I have a friend named uh, Random, and he goes by Mega Rand. Uh, he appeals to like a whole slew of like comic book enthusiasts and, and 
game fanatics. I know like, he goes to Comic Con, and you know that's what he's known for is his rap over like you know that's that, that, that style. And stuff like yeah, that. making yeah. stuff with video games and stuff, you know. <laughs> so I mean, there's a niche for everything, you know. So. <clears throat> My question was kind of like, I wanted to know each one of you, like, personal views on, like, new school hip-hop, like, how they have, like, the hard, like, catchy beats, and then they're spitting gibberish, and like, all this stuff. <laughs> 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 about it, you know, love the cocoa, or you want to sip some lean, let's go. Well, um, honestly, you're always going to have things like that. You're always going to have, uh, it's like, I mean, like how my parents came up. I mean, I was in middle school, and whatever, or when I was a kid, I was in the P-Day and stuff. He was talking about Cristal, Papa Champagne, and all that stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, that's always going to be around regardless of what the delivery is. Look at Tupac. He talked about bitches, hoes, and smoking weed, and sherm, and all this other stuff. But his delivery was different, you know what I mean? He made you want to listen to it. You're like, oh, dang, this guy is doing all this stuff. But at the same time, you're intrigued by the story, you know? But now, it's more about like, oh, it's a catchy beat, it's a catchy hook. I like it, you know? Yeah. I don't know, understand what they're saying in the middle of all that <laughs> stuff. And it's all auto-tuned and all, you know, like, it's not any different from like, I mean, just yesterday, he showed me, showed us an a, a 80s song that was made back in the 80s that was pro talking about, you know, smoking crack. Like, let's crack it up, let's crack it You know, that was an 80s rap song that came out in, in New York, you know? And and he barely showed it to us yesterday. And it's like, wow, like, I didn't know there was songs like that back then. But, I mean, you're always going to have people like that, you know what I mean? Look at Wiz Khalifa, he raps about the Beatles, you know? <laughs> and, and, I mean, the issue isn't those songs that are being made, the issue is the consumers that are supporting those records. Because the fact is, if fans don't buy those records and play those records and stream those records, those records won't be made. Because all these artists want to do is make money. All they want to do is make a living. If, if they say, oh, everybody's rapping about cocaine and it's winning, I'm going to rap about cocaine and see if I can win too. Rick Ross's multi-platinum, let me, let me do what he took, do what he do, rap about being a drug dealer. So, as quickly as the consumer changes, that's how quickly the industry will change with it. Um, I, I hear so many consumers complain about the content that they use it and what's on the radio. All you gotta do is not support that music because the radio, the radio stations, they want your dollars. They want advertising dollars. They don't care if you if you say this is what we like, we'll, we'll play that. They, they, they're not forcing. They, they're playing what they think people want to hear. If people say, no, that's not what we want to hear, we want to hear something more positive, and that's what the, that's what the dollars are, then guess what? The programming will change. And it has to start with the consumer. The artists are going to make what they're going to make. They're going to make nonsense, they're going to be in the basement, they're going to get fruity loops, they're going to make a song, and it's going to be nonsense and gibberish, like you said, and they're going to put it out. If nobody supports that record. Like we. We should never know who Soldier Boy even is, <laughs> like, because he just did, he just do some crap together in his basement and put it out, and everybody went crazy and wanted to do this dance, and now he's like a, a known person in the music business because of that one record. Um, but there's no real creative viability here, no creativity here, um, and what? But there was a fan base for it. As long as there's a fan base, that kind of music is going to continue to be made, unfortunately. When enough of us are sick of it and band together and support the good stuff, then you'll see a shift. I mean, the shift has actually started to happen. Um, I saw a statistic the other day that, um, that, that, that Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar, uh, J. Cole, and, and Joe Badass, they outsold. Um, uh, Young Thug and, and two, or, two or three of Yo Gotti, two, two or three of these other kind of Dallas Southern kind of uh, negative kind of rappers, I was sold them. And that shows a, a, a clear shift in what's happening in, in music. And, and, and for me, that's a, a sign of hope. That's, that, that's a good thing. Um, so we're going in the right direction, I think. So too. It feels like it's a trend right now that those rappers that were supporting, according to those trends, it's going 
but like being said, I feel like there's a shift too happening where <coughs> leaders are getting recognition and getting true spirit. We're really about like culture, not making money, but actually getting the message true. And that, that's been a good day. Thank you so much, y'all. Uh...